Natasha Ayer is someone I actually knew when I first came here in the 1970s and I remember him as a delightful old man and at that time I didn't really appreciate what his history was here or what his connection and role was in the history of the ashram and its food. He was a bit of a figure of fun. Uh, he was laughed at by many of the small children who lived in Raman Ashram because like the famous saint Ramakrishna Paramahamsa, he couldn't stand touching money. There was something that was so pure about him that if money touched his skin, he would get a burning sensation in his body. But this, this, was, this was in later life, not, not early on. As his practice matured, there was something about money that physically his body couldn't tolerate. And the boys in the ashram knew this, and they used to chase him around the ashram, wa waving rupee notes at him and try trying to bang him on his body. And there'd be these strange sights of Natasha Iyer fleeing from these small boys who were trying to pin money on him just to see what would happen. Now, Natasha Iyer was born in Chidambaram, uh, had a wife and a family who apparently he abandoned. No, no reports ever of what happened to them. And he made his way to Tiruvannamalai around 1922, where he first met Bhagavan. At that time, he wasn't uh, that interested in becoming a devotee or living in the ashram. He started off working at a Hindu chaltry in town, and then later he was taken on as a worker in the Arunachalaswara temple. There he was helping with the kitchens, and he was also grinding sandal paste. Uh, when, I, when I knew him in the 1970s, he was in charge of the old hall, and you always knew where he was because he had a gigantic key, key ring with about 20 big keys, and he had a kind of shaking, palsied hand, so it was a bit like a cowbell. You, al you always knew where Natasha I was because there'd be this jingle, 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 jingle wherever he was in the ashram. When he was asked about this, he said, they worked me very hard in these temples. I had to grind sandalwood paste endlessly. And there was something, it was an occupational stress injury from having to grind too much sandal paste when he was a worker in the temple. Chinnaswami got to hear about him. He started coming to Raman Ashram, fell in love with Bhagavan, and Chinnaswami was delighted that uh, a Brahmin who knew how to chant the Vedas, which he did, and was also a good cook, was looking for an employment opportunity, so he was taken on as a cook at Raman Ashram. Now what surprises me is that he was given a very junior position here. He wasn't one of the main cooks in the ashram. He was the kind of the sous chef, the person who did all the grunt work, the cleaning, uh, the tidying up. And he was under five very determined, bossy Brahmin widows. And he had a really rough time for a long time in the ashram. He would come and people have told me that he would get very frustrated, very angry, and instead of letting off steam at these Brahmin widows who were bossing him around, he would go outside and ro roll around in the dirt, screaming at the top of his voice to let, to let off his anger. And when Bhagavan would hear screams and say, well, what's, what's going on there? Uh, people would say, oh, it's just Natasha. Natasha Iyer has just had another session with the widows. He's letting off steam. And Bhag Bhagavan would laugh. And then uh, one day, Natasha Iyer decided that he'd go for a production and he asked Bhagavan's permission and said, I, I, I need to calm down, I need to, to cool down a bit, these women are too much for me. And Bhagavan said, yes, yes, very good idea. So from that point on, his medicine for his bad temper was to do a Pradakshina, and he would always tell Bhagavan he was going, and apparently when he was away, Bhagavan would tell everybody else in the hall, Nat Natasha Ayer has gone for a walk around the hill to calm down, and Nat Natasha Ayer firmly believed that this was an act of Bhagavan's grace, that Bhagavan approved of these productioners and by giving him permission to take this time off to walk around the hill. He was also purifying his mind and allowing his 
excess anger to be ground down to nothing. I think Natasha Iyer had a kind of a mind or an ego that Bhagavan decided really did need to be ground down in adverse circumstances. Uh, Anamale Swami was somebody who in the 1930s, if, if you had a problem and didn't want to discuss it publicly in the hall, you would go to Anamale Swami and say, please tell Bhagavan about this, 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 because everybody knew that Anamale Swami had an hour of private building conversations with Bhagavan. So that, that was the, he was the ideal intermediary as Bhagavan was inspecting building works, Anamale Swami could say, by the way, so-and-so's got this problem. Bhagavan would give a reply, and Anamale Swami would pass it on. So Anamale Swami told me that various people would bring their problems and complaints, and Bhagavan would always have something constructive to say, some advice, or he'd slightly adjust the situation in the ashram, so that the person who was doing the complaining had a better situation. However, when the Tesha Ayer brought his problem to Anamale Swami's attention and said, ask Bhagavan. Bhagavan absolutely refused to do anything. I think Bhagavan somehow knew that Natasha Iyer was a unique, unique case, that there was something in him that needed to be uh, subdued, that he needed to go through this process and that he needed to have his mind ground down to nothing. Now, when Natasha Iyer first came here, he had a little private puja box inside which were five different statues. And he used to do elaborate pujas to them every morning. He had a room somewhere between uh, Bhagavan's hall and the cow shed because ev every morning Bhagavan would come at about 9 a.m. to inspect the cows. Natasha Iyer would have done his long elaborate puja by this point and he would ask Bhagavan to inspect the idols that he'd cleaned and done worship to. And every single day for two years, Bhagavan would come, he'd admire them and say, very nice. Now, I think this is a really outstanding example of how Bhagavan didn't interfere in the sadhana, the spiritual practices of devotees who came. Whatever you came with, if you did it well, if you had faith in it, he was happy to let you continue, even to the point of every single day for two years, stopping off in your room to inspect the same five statues after you'd cleaned them and worshipped them. However, after two years, um, Bhagavan just casually remarked, oh, so, you, so you're still doing this, are you? And Natasha Iyer said there was something about that casual comment which sent shivers down his body. He said there was a physical a wave of quivering in his body, and something inside him knew that his days of doing daily pujas to these five statues was over. He said, without a moment's hesitation, I put those five statues back in their box. I walked to Palitirtam, which is the main tank behind the mother's samadhi. He said, I threw them in, and I never was interested in pujas again. I should say that uh, in the Hindu tradition, if you have a sacred object and you need to get rid of it, the prescribed way of doing it is to immerse it ceremonially in a, a temple tank. So he, he respected the idols he'd worshipped for many, many years, but he realized his time doing daily pujas to them was over. And without any regrets, he placed them into Palutirtam, walked away and never did pujas again. I think this was part of his surrendering to Bhagavan process. He said, from that moment, I really felt like I was nothing, that my world revolved around Bhagavan. There were no alternative deities to worship. In 1935, he didn't often talk to Bhagavan. He, he said that there was something paralyzing about Bhagavan's presence. He said, like Dakshinamurti teaching in silence, he said, when I went into Bhagavan's presence, there was such a silence, such a stillness. It was like being caught in the headlamps. There was something that you couldn't move, you couldn't think, you couldn't do anything. But very early on, he summoned up courage to ask Bhagavan to give him some upadesha, some teaching from the guru that he should contemplate on or try to practice. And uh, Bhagavan said, why? And he said, 
because I, because I know nothing. And Bhagavan said, hold, hold on to that nothingness. Find out what that nothingness is. When you know that nothingness to be what it really is, that is liberation. I think from that moment on, that was Natasha Ayers. That was his, that was his path. It was to slowly attenuate his mind, slowly diminish his ego to the point where he, Natasha Ayer, simply didn't exist anymore and that only Bhagavan's presence shining in him was left. At some point in the 1930s, the, the bullying of the women cooks got too much for him and going, going for a production that didn't seem to be uh, much of a, a solution. So he decided that he was going to go back to his native place, Chidambaram. At that point, he'd already given up money. This was the phase in his life where he couldn't hold on to money without burning. So he had, he had no means to go home except walking. So he took off from Tiruvannamalai and started walking in the general direction of Chidambaram and managed to reach a town called Villapuram by the end of the day. Now Villapuram is about 60 kilometers from here. And before, before I continue with this story, I have to say I'm seriously impressed by the amount of walking that Bhagavan's devotees managed to get to do in the good old days. One of Bhagavan's devotees was his barber called Nateshin. Nateshin lived in a town 33 kilometers north of here. And on full moon day, Nateshin would walk 33 kilometers to Tiruvannamalai. He would come to Bhagavan, uh, shave Bhagavan's head, do a production, and then walk back to Polo, which I calculate to be a round trip of about 80, 80 plus kilometers. And this he did every month. And good for him, he did it well into his 70s and apparently had a heart attack on the production road when he was well into his 70s, which I consider to be a wonderful way to go. Uh, there were devotees such as Mastan, Swami, uh, Akalandama. They would not only walk the 40 kilometers to come and see Bhagavan, they would load themselves up with enough food to feed Bhagavan and all his devotees for several days. So they, they would put a head load of, I'm guessing, 40, 50 pounds on their head and probably walk barefoot. They said they did it in a day, which I also find quite impressive. They would stay with Bhagavan and then they'd walk back to their village after a few days. So back to Natasha Aya. Natasha Aya has just walked 60 kilometers to Villapuram. It's going dark. He said he found uh, a tamarind tree, which was hollow on the inside. He thought that would be a nice cozy place to spend the night. He managed to find a place to have a bath. He said he put some bibuti on his forehead, sat down to me meditate, and when he opened his eyes, Bhagavan was standing in front of him with a smile on his face, saying, how far away from me have you managed to go? Um, at which point, Natasha, I realized that running away wasn't really the solution to his problems. And at a more philosophical level, he also realized that it wasn't possible ever to be away from Bhagavan. So the, fig the figure of Bhagavan, now this, this is a man who has already walked 60 kilometers. He realized he had to return to Tiruvannamalai immediately. The apparition of Bhagavan, it wasn't really Bhagavan, started walking down the road towards Tiruvannamalai. Natasha Ayer had already walked 60 kilometers that day, but he started following this figure, always keeping it in sight, and at some point, the figure of Bhagavan disappeared into the gloom. He arrived back after a walking round trip of 120 kilometers, went into Bhagavan's hall. Now, he hadn't told Bhagavan that he was leaving, so Bhagavan really wouldn't have had any knowledge of this walk to Villapuram, the apparition, and Natasha Ayer coming back. But Bhagavan said exactly the same thing to Natasha Ayer that the apparition had said at Villapuram. How far away do you think you can go from me? At that point, Natasha Ayer said, I just burst into tears. I prostrated to him and I promised myself that I would never leave him again. <laughs> Natasha Ayer 
didn't really have much of a philosophical background. He didn't talk very much to the people who knew him about what was going on inside him. But he did more or less indirectly say that he had a direct experience of who Bhagavan really was, saying always that that particular experience wasn't possible to communicate in words. He said you have to experience it for yourself just to know how, how wonderful and how sweet it is. And I, I would just like to read one paragraph that he told to one of his oldest friends a, cu a couple of decades later. Bhagavan is not something or someone that we can fathom with our minds. We have to admit our ignorance and our inability to say anything about him that is true. When we accept that Bhagavan is unfathomable, when we surrender our compulsion to understand and explain him, we fall into a deep silence that is the experience of the real Bhagavan within us. This is what happened to me. I cannot tell you anything about Bhagavan because the real Bhagavan cannot be explained in words. However, I can say it's a sweet taste and you can only know it by tasting it for yourself. Now, Natasha Ayer, as I said, didn't often communicate with Bhagavan except for that one early Upadesha where Bhagavan told him to find out the nothingness in himself. But he was in the kitchen on occasions when Bhagavan spoke to the other cooks and gave them advice. And there, there is one particular quote that he overheard Bhagavan telling to one of the Brahmin widows who did most of the cookings, cooking. And I, I want to read it out because it's, I think it's the only time in the Bhagavan literature where Bhagavan said something like this. And I think it's quite crucial for an understanding of just how important correct preparation of food is in Bhagavan's world. So this is what Bhagavan said to one of the cooks who was complaining about being overworked. Don't give any importance to what the body is doing. Try to go beyond it and be a witness to it. You think you are suffering, but actually you are being blessed by doing all this work in the kitchen because you are feeding so many devotees. You can pass on these blessings to the people who eat here by having the right attitude to the work. If you do your work with an introverted mind, the quality of food you prepare will change in a subtle way. Devotees who eat food that has been prepared by introverted minds will find that their own minds will also become introverted. Now this is an extraordinary insight into Bhagavan's attitude towards diet. When I talked about self-inquiry, I mentioned that Bhagavan sometimes said that the best aid to self-inquiry was sattvic food in moderate quantities. Um, when I said that, I defined the food in terms of its freshness and its ingredients. For example, fresh milk, fruit would be regarded as sattvic, uh, chilies, ginger, that kind of stuff would be regarded as rajasic. What Bhagavan is saying here is that the gunas in a particular serving of food are less dependent on the ingredients than on the attitude and mental purity of the people who are preparing the food. So what Bhagavan is saying is that if you prepare food with a quiet, introverted mind, then the sattva that's in your mind will be transmitted to the people who are eating the food in the dining room. By extension, I should say that the person, the purest person in the kitchen doing the chopping and the cooking was Bhagavan himself. And since for most of his time at Raman Ashram, he went there every morning and personally supervised the cooks and chopped vegetables himself, I think it would be fair to say that there was a, an immense uh, sattva content to everything that was served in this dining room simply because of the circumstances under which the food was prepared uh, earlier in the day. Natasha Ayer continued to serve in the kitchen and if, if you spoke to him as I did in the 70s, he would say, have I told you about the day when I witnessed Bhagavan's operation? That this for him was the highlight of his life. Bhagavan was in the, the hospital building having one of his cancer operations. And for some reason, I have no idea why, Natasha Iyer was in there with him. Why, why one of the cooks had to be there, I don't know. Perhaps must have been by special invitation. Natasha Iyer said we were in that room for 
about three hours. He said Bhagavan was fully conscious throughout all of those three hours. He said you could see the blood coming out of Bhagavan's elbows, you could see the pus, ra radium needles were being inserted into the elbow. He said it was a full-on, seemingly very painful operation. And he said Bhagavan was there in a state of bliss. There was a quality, a silence in that room. And he said, it wasn't just me. I was, I was a devotee. You expect someone like me to feel quiet in Bhagavan's presence. He said it was so tangible that the doctors themselves felt it. And at the end of the operation, he said everybody in that room, including the imported doctors who weren't even devotees, spontaneously prostrated to Bhagavan because for the previous three hours, they'd all experienced this incredible silence, this incredible peace in the room where Bhagavan was having his operation. Now, Natasha Iyer said this was a key moment in his life. He knew from this that Bhagavan wasn't his body. And by extension, he came to understand that he himself was not the body either. Now, the, the next story was told to me by one of his old friends who looked after him in the 60s and 70s. He eventually became too feeble to continue work in the dining room. As I said, he looked after the old hall. And he had some kind of uh, major medical episode that required him to be taken by car to CMC Hospital in Velour. That's the nearest big, good quality hospital to here. And on the way there, he was constantly talking about Bhagavan's teachings on I am not the body. He would mention dialogues he'd listened to, he would cite extracts from books. And he got so animated talking about these I am not the body statements that he was told, no, you must, you must rest, you must rest, don't, don't be so active, uh, settle down, be quiet, you're in a very serious physical condition. Natasha Ayer said, my, my rest is in Bhagavan. I rest in Bhagavan's presence. I don't need anywhere else to rest. I have, I have found the ultimate place to rest, and that place is in Bhagavan's presence. That's what I'm talking about. I don't need to rest my body because I'm not the body. I have found out who Bhagavan truly is, and that's where I take my rest all the time now. So he went to the hospital. He had some treatment. He was discharged, but uh, I think it was quite clear that his days were coming to an end. At that time, he was actually living in this dining room. I, I used to come and eat my meals here in the 1970s, and there'd be this rather odd sight of Natasha Iyer lying on a wooden table in the corner of the dining room. At that stage of his life, he had one, one dhoti, one little towel that went round his head, he had a copy of Bhagavan's collected works and one copy of the Periyaparanam. Those were his only worldly possessions. And I think out of consideration to his immaculate service to Bhagavan, he was, he was allowed to sleep in the dining room because that's where he'd always stayed in his time at Ramanashram. Now, sometime after he was discharged from CMC, uh, one of his other friends came to see him and Natasha Iyer was absolutely delighted, not because he was healthy or because he'd had a good experience, because he'd just been given the knowledge that in a small number of days' time, he was going to pass away, and for him, passing away meant that he was going to join Bhagavan. In the, in the 1930s, he used to chant the Vedas with the boys, but he hadn't chanted them for many years after that. So he told this friend of his, uh, next time you come, I will, I will be chanting with the Patasala boys. I will be chanting the Vedas with the Patasala boys. Now this was a bit of a surprise because he hadn't done it for decades. But what he was indirectly hinting at was that the Patasala boys would do their chanting on Bhagavan Samadhi. And he was saying, I'm not long for this world. Next time you come, I will have merged with Bhagavan's lingam in the Samadhi. So this, this is a wonderful account I'm going to read now. It's Natasha Iyer's final days, described by an Andrew friend of his who came to see him over the last 10 days of his life. 
Natasha Aya knew in advance that he was about to pass away. Raju, this is the recorder of the story, he said to me in high spirits, Bhagavan is calling me, I am going in ten days. The next day when he saw me, he began the same theme, joyfully, but with a slight change. Bhagavan is calling me, I am going away in nine days. Three days later, Natasha Aya lost his appetite. The doctors who examined him said he was suffering from no disease. In those days, he slept in a corner of the dining room. The devotees there forcibly made him drink orange juice. The next time I saw him, his spirits were still high. Raju, only five days more. I'm going in five days. He pointed to his breast, put his hand there and announced, Bhagavan is calling me. His physical condition was deteriorating, but he was still full of energy. Natasha Aya became very weak and was unable to take even liquid food. Fearing that he might die soon, he was shifted to a far corner of the ashram. A few days later, I went to see him there, taking a bunch of grapes as an offering. When he saw me approach, he opened his eyes, showed me two fingers and said, two more days, I'm going in two days. His eyes were shining like lights, almost as if he did not belong to this world. He looked like he was happily going home. Someone who was present said, there is no need to fear, you'll live for many more days. Fear, said Natasha Aya, I have no fear. It's simply the calling of Bhagavan. The next day he was moved to the ashram hospital. I went to see him there. Raju, Raju, only one more day. I'm going to merge with Sri Ramana Paramatman, Sri Ramana, the Supreme Self. On the tenth day, Natasha Aya lost consciousness, but his face suddenly became very bright. In a spirited tone, he inquired, has Bhagavan come? I'm coming. Those were the last words that came from his lips, and he died a few minutes later. Namo Ramanayana Lampera Varna Vimochana Meyan Virai Malattar Varna Namo Ramanayana Lampera Varna Vimochana Meyan Virai Malattar Varna Namo Ramanayana Lampera Varna Vimochana Meyan Vidai 